Welcome to this session based on a toolkit that was created by um, Lara Brooks and myself. And the toolkit is called Whose Security Is It Anyway? A toolkit to address institutional violence in nonprofit organizations. Um, Lara will be back in a minute to just share some context for how this toolkit came into being and when and et cetera. But I'm just going to uh, first kick us off and get us um, ready to go. So my name is Miriam Kaba. I'm the founder and director of Project NIA and also co-founder of Interrupting Criminalization. I welcome you on behalf of both of those groups um, this afternoon or evening. I wanna welcome Lara who will introduce themselves to you and um, offer more context for this afternoon and evening. So Lara, you are on. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be uh, joining all of you for this conversation. I, um, a little bit about me, I have been doing youth work since the early 2000s and I am a white person, queer, non-binary, um, and Midwest grown and taught, and everything excellent and good that I have learned, I've learned from Chicago um, organizers and youth workers and educators. Um, I do not identify as an educator, and so I'm definitely pushing myself out of my comfort zone today um, because I um, I do radically love youth work and um, I'm excited to share with you some of the learnings from my work specifically at the Broadway Youth Center between, I think it was 2003, 2004 to 2013. Miriam and I came together to put this toolkit together because we um, wanted to provide, of course, tools um, for youth workers and um, educators, people working in drop-in centers, people um, working in a range of different um, settings. We, um, and we also wanted to um, equip those folks with tools that they could bring to their directors, to the executive team of their organizations with really compelling reasons for why um, organizations, um, schools, um, a range of different settings should um, should and can divest from um, engaging with law enforcement or on-site security. And, um, and so the toolkit um, really takes um, uh, the reader through um, the costs and um, Miriam's going to spend some time talking about that. Um, and so yeah, that was that was the inspiration. I think something formal looking. It was like, how do we, you know, put something kind of glossy and shiny together that looks like um, there are other strategies, other ways of approaching this work. I, um, I've most of my work um, has been um, working with young people experiencing homelessness, um, working with queer and trans young people, uh, young people in the sex trade and street economies, and um, young people living with HIV. And I came to that work um, uh, from um, uh, the domestic violence and sexual assault um, movement space and um, felt really conflicted about what I was experiencing as um, uh, uh, what we're going to talk a little bit later as it relates to um, the some of the words we're going to be using youth control complex but really just um, so impacted by what I was experiencing as increasing carceral stuff within um, shelter settings and the ways that um, domestic violence shelters and programs that I was working for were participating in perpetuating that. And so um, I uh, uh, left that work um, and um, was so excited to become a part of a really, um, I think, um, transformative youth work community. And then after that, um, uh, left to start a storage initiative for young people experiencing homelessness in Chicago. And I'll talk a little bit about some learnings from that as well and have been in the Bay Area for the last five years, um, uh, more, more so focused on um, working um, in the 
um, queer and trans um, health and substance health space. So that's a little bit about me. And I'll, I think, kick it back to Miriam now, or do I keep going? You can keep going. Yeah. All right. So really quickly, I want to um, just give some shout outs um, to some organizations that um, some of um, organizations that no longer exist. We can um, go to the uh, next slide, I think. Um, Young Women's Empowerment Project. Um, uh, hugely informed the work that we did at the Broadway Youth Center. Want to lift up, of course, Project Nia. Um, there was a, a campaign launch um, by Young Women's Empowerment Project called Street Youth Rise Up that still has um, ongoing work today in Chicago. Uh, and Queers for Economic Justice also really informed the thinking. They came out with a report. I am spacing on um, what year, but really talking about um, uh, some of the intense ways in which um, carceral values were showing up in um, uh, shelters for people experiencing homelessness, et cetera, and um, really connected a lot of dots for us when we were trying to come up with our, our violence prevention and intervention strategies. And then, of course, lastly, to um, Chicago harm reduction folks and youth workers. And, um, and then I think most importantly, this work is really informed by um, uh, clients and participants and young people. And um, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but, you know, um, I think conflict is a really important resource, especially in youth settings. And so, um, you know, a lot of the work came from Young Women's Empowerment Project's research on institutional violence. And specifically at the time, they had a bad encounter line. And the findings really showcase the ways in which young people in the sex trade were being harmed and targeted um, by both law enforcement and social service and healthcare settings. And so um, that led to um, a campaign, Street Youth Rise Up and a Street Youth Bill of Rights. And um, a lot of the that work informed how we began to think about even complaints and grievances as opportunities for transformation in our youth um, spaces. So we'll um, post some links to some of that research. And, um, and then really quickly, we can go to the next slide. Um, the objectives for today are to talk about the impact and range of the helping industries collusion with the prison industrial complex, um, to talk about strategies for reducing and eliminating the need for a reliance on law enforcement within a social service and healthcare context. I think for the purposes of today, um, I will draw on mostly experiences working with young people, uh, but I do believe that a lot of these strategies can be applied to lots of different settings as well. And then um, finally, we won't have too much um, of an opportunity to practice as a group, um, but we will review um, and talk about the Broadway Youth Center specifically as a case um, study. Um, so the um, uh, next slide, um, has a, a picture of the cover of the toolkit and um, and really takes um, folks through a bunch of different um, uh, tools. There's um, the Street Youth Bill of Rights is featured in there. Um, there's an overview of what we're going to spend some time talking about later um, uh, as a part of the case study. And, um, and it also has some advocacy tools for folks um, and young people who are participating in um, uh, youth work settings or our um, leaders in um, some of these community-based organizations as well. So I'll kick it back over to Mariam to talk a little bit about the costs of security, surveillance, and policing in youth organizations, social services, and healthcare. Great. You can Thank go you to the so next much. slide. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah. So as Laura mentioned, um, we got together, I think, in the early 10s um, initially to talk about, um, Lara had been doing these really excellent uh, workshops that were taking um, folks who were working in these nonprofit settings through you know, activities, space for conversation about how to basically do better by the young people that they were encountering and uh, focused, <laughs> exactly. It took a long time to make the toolkit and we just, you know, we were working and we had other things going and um, it just took a minute. But one of, the, one of the things that I found interesting, you know, 
was in conversations with Lara over time, you know, as comrades, colleagues, and friends, um, a lot of stories were coming up, you know, um, where the cops, for example, would, you know, raid uh, group homes. I experienced this um, when we were in Rogers Park doing work with some young people in a group home in our community um, where, you know, when something went down in the neighborhood, in the community, the police felt fine barging into the group home and fil literally pilfering through all the materials and supplies and the belongings of the young people who were in that group home. No warrants, no warning, no nothing, right? Um, and people were just stumped, like, what, what do we do about that? Um, or you end up in a setting, and like, this happened in my case as well, where I was working at the local high school in our community, uh, doing, offering this thing called uh, Sharing and Knowing Yourself, which was a program for young people who identified as young girls and young women. Um, and uh, we would run these after school projects for them and they were kind of like self development uh, slash anti violence interventions poetry circles, things like that and. Um, uh, every girl young person who came into that group had a story almost every I mean it was so rare not to hear this story of the security so quote unquote or the cops who were actually the security in the school sexually harassing them um at school on school premises um and that was a thing you know uh there were examples of um situations where you people would come into a youth center and there would be security cameras all around everywhere including in the bathrooms you know like just things like that that kept coming up over and over again and that young people noticed and young people would point out and, you know, it was like, does it really actually have to be this way? And the answer for us was, of course, it doesn't have to be this way. And if you go in the toolkit and you're taking a look at it, if you're looking through it as we talk, um, where the part I'm focusing on right now is the cost of security and surveillance and policing and youth organizations, social services and healthcare, pages eight through, uh, through 10 in the in the um, in the book in the uh, booklet I'm not going to go through all of the points I'm just going to raise a you know three or four points that aren't going to be a shock to you I mean the costs are monetary monetary in the sense that a lot of people are paying for security guards or paying for security cameras or hiring people to basically control young people in the space under the guise that they're quote trying to keep the space secure. So lots of resources being poured into that resources that could be used for any number of other things that could also create safety and security and probably more so in those particular spaces. Um, a lot of spaces, you know, for years I did work in Chicago around um, trying to push uh, to break the, the kind of cycle between the school and the prison system. And we did a number of interventions. We had ran a peace room at our local school, middle school, um, as Project NIA for a few years, uh, where we were, I hired somebody who was a counselor, who had a licensed professional counselor, and then we had a we had trainings in the community to like train up community people so that they could go into that particular school and run restorative circles and other kinds of interventions. They were all volunteers. Um, and, you know, as a way to say, like, you don't actually have to quote unquote, expel all these students that are in this school and put them in greater danger because now they're outside with no connection to an institution like a school that could provide for some of their needs like food like their friends like an opportunity to be engaged you know we want to be here to offer this space as an alternative quote unquote to suspension expulsion and arrest which was happening a lot at this particular middle school when i say middle school i mean like elementary through eighth grade is what we were talking about here um, and so, you know, having having cops on the premises of these institutions increases, of course, the likelihood that young people will be actually more criminalized and will find themselves within the school to prison pipeline or within the community center to prison pipeline. And so 
that's a cost of having security, quote unquote, in policing within these spaces. Um, there's also uh, the issue of kind of uh, an opportunity that's lost to actually develop the skills needed to resolve conflict in a non-carceral way. That's a skill that young people who learn that at a very young age could actually be able to take into their lives in other places. Learning how to resolve conflict at a young age allows you to be able to kind of have these skills to be able to move on and move forward um, to be able to do that. So I think that, you know, those are just some examples of that. The most important thing to remember is that cops don't actually stop violence. Okay, often they escalate it. Often they escalate it. Often they cause additional harm. And I want to just put a link to a new report that Andrea Ritchie um, bottom line from interrupting criminalization called uh, cops don't stop violence for those people who need it, ex you know, who need to kind of have it specifically explained with statistics, you can go ahead and look at that report to get a sense of the ways in which cops don't actually stop violence. And we have to start to think about what actually works what actually makes our community safe or not 100% safe because we're never going to have 100% quote safety. What can we do to increase safety for, for people and for, to increase people's feelings of being safe, if not the reality of it, right? So those are just some of the things that I wanted to point out. Lara, is there anything here that you want to add to? No, thank you for um, highlighting some of those. Agree, agree, agree. <laughs> awesome. So I'll throw back to you for the next part. All right. Um, in going to the next slide, um, I just want to take a moment to read this. The spectrum of social and healthcare services at its most extreme is comparable to a correctional facility. And, you know, Mariam just described several examples of um, how true that is. And this um, finding um, really um, uh, came super forward for me when um, I was looking at the research that Queers for Economic Justice did. Um, I think it was probably over a decade ago through some of their participatory action research. And, um, and you know, I was even thinking about an example from when I was um, working to actualize increased storage for young people experiencing homelessness, knowing that um, so many young people do not have consistent or reliable access for everything from um, identification and school documents to really precious things that they have from um, family members, clothing, um, all of those pieces. And one of the things we also learned um, through that work was the importance of um, digital storage and having access to um, phones that could, you know, folks could store stuff um, via Google Docs, et cetera, and how many um, spaces and entities were actually blocking access to electrical outlets. So even preventing use of electricity for young people to um, even um, uh, juice up their their phones, which is an, an, a hugely important lifeline. And I think for me, the message that was sent was, wow, it this is so comparable to a correctional facility. Um, we will control when and how you have access to privacy. We will control how and when you have access to um, uh, storage for your most precious items. Um, and a lot of the pushback around having access to storage was like, oh, this is a liability thing. This is a risk thing. We don't know what young people are storing. And so again, it just reaffirms this belief that, um, uh, that young people are um, inherently unworthy of having a space of their own for their own things, which um, is a really important, I think, example of how, um, how much work is ahead. Um, and then we can skip past the next few slides. Um, these are more examples um, of, um, yeah, great. Uh, so let's talk about shared language. Um, I would love for Miriam to jump in about this because I think that 
Um, I'm imagining that a lot of the conversations as a part of this toolbox series have um, talked about transformative justice. We can go to the, the next slide. And, um, and what I wanna say here is that um, I'm one of those people that has um, spent a career of working inside very complex, sometimes dysfunctional, um, sometimes institutional um, organizations and, and, um, and specifically community-based organizations. And so I, um, uh, really lean on transformative justice values and principles to guide the work. Um, but um, what we'll be talking about today as a part of our case study, I just want to be super clear that the Broadway Youth Center um, efforts were not, it, 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 the center wasn't a transformative justice um, project. Um, we had so many limitations and um, so many things to work around. And so I think what I'm trying to offer today is um, strategies for those workarounds and um, the small is all like there are things that you can start doing tomorrow or next month that are incredibly meaningful and really align with the values. Um, but I'm talking about in this case working inside of systems um, and not outside of systems, but um, really thinking about how um, we can continue to be complementary and a lot of the movement work that I was a part of really inspired a lot of the social service delivery changes and shifts that we made at the Broadway Youth Center. And so for that to be mutually reinforcing and talking to one another, I think is really powerful. Ma'am, do you want to say anything about that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just add a couple of things here, which is I think in something that Lara and I was were talking about last week was that the context that we're in right now is so different than the context we were in in 2010. And in part, the reason I don't need to go into a million different slides about how harmful the cops and police are in the systems that we work in is that we have moved from that point. I don't think most people need to be convinced about the harms that come from police and policing anymore. Whereas when Lara and I were talking about all of this, like in the mid 2000s, it was actually hard to get people to see in a different kind of way the ways in which policing had a negative impact on our spaces, right? And we had a different task at that point that we were taking on. And um, I wanna just add to this notion, and the reason I preface that is because I think even the term transformative justice has shifted in terms of what people understand it to be now and how much more developed it is in people's minds and how many more kind of strategies people have used. I am one of those people and not all TJ practitioners believe this, but I do, which is that I don't think you can really do transformative justice within institutions like schools. I don't think it's a place to do it within kind of your necessarily nonprofit -y workplace. I do think you can use, trans you can infuse your spaces with TJ values, but I think the actual processes of doing that are hard to do in some of these places that have lots of rules around um, mandated reporting, that have lots of rules around liability and everybody's afraid of getting sued, which I get and I understand, right? I think sometimes people have tried to take things that we do in community outside to the extent that we can ever get outside the state. People take that and they think we can actually do it inside the state. Um, and I think that I think that we should not be trying to fit uh, square pegs into round ho holes. I think we, sh but there are ways, and that's what we'll be talking about today, to take the values of TJ and apply them, and to do a lot of harm reduction um, in various kinds of ways. And I think that's okay to do, um, and it will also leave people with less to be less conflicted. And then we can create other spaces outside those spaces where we can do this more deep rooted radical transformative work that we want to be doing on a regular basis so i'm just going to pull out a few of the um a few of the kind of values that i think can be brought in from tj into into these kinds of spaces um i think that it's really important 
to always be thinking about shifting power, even when you're within these institutions, doing that work of shifting power. So the people with the least power are able to access some power, you know, more power is really critical and important. And that's big, that's a value of TJ. Uh, or the notion of the value of collective action is a TJ value. Um, more safety is a TJ value. Um, thinking about sustainability for your organization is a TJ value. Prioritizing care is a TJ value. Um, you know, I, I can go on and on, but you get the idea that you can take that. You can take the creativity that we, we, you know, the creative processes that we use in TJ, those can go into these institutions and in these spaces. Um, being patient with yourself and others, you know, those things are all TJ values that can be brought in in multiple kinds of ways to these other spaces. But we are not, I do not think we're doing, quote, transformative justice processes within these spaces. And I think that I'm, uh, oh gosh, uh, Queen Cheyenne, I'm not going to remember off the top of my head. I'm kind of thinking as I didn't write it down, but I will come back to to it if I remember again what I said. But there'll be also a video. Uh, there'll be we'll post publicly this uh, this information, so you'll be able to get it that way too. Thank you. Um, and uh, also, I hear Laura here in the chat saying I appreciate that because honestly, this is what feels draining. It's what makes it feel like it's difficult to create change. I understand. I understand. And sometimes it feels like you're beating your head against uh, a wall uh, over and over and over again, and that can be discouraging. Rather than doing that, in my, in my opinion, and in Lara's as well, and our experience is how can we? What can we do in the spaces we're in? to do less harm? How can we use the resources within those spaces to create more, more opportunities for young people to find uh, a way to, to thrive, to be more themselves, to uh, have a stepping stone to getting to the next thing, you know? So I just think that it's really important to, uh, you know, to, to hold that and to do the best you can. But a lot of these are, you know, these institutions of entrenched power, you know, entrenched uh, oppressions, all that other kind of thing can really make it hard. So like part of this toolkit is like, do what you can where you are and make it better than it was when you're gone, if to the extent that you can. Sorry, okay, Lara, I'm gonna let you get on with the rest of it. <laughs> Thank you. No, I really appreciate that. And what I'm going to do is post um, uh, some of these definitions in the chat, youth control complex. Um, I'm going to post the institutional violence definition that I'm going to be referencing today. Um, and harm reduction is, um, let's see, a much longer one. Let me, I'll, I'll put this in here and if folks have questions, let me know. Um, um, but I do want to spend some time talking about low barrier and how we can lead to multi-threshold. Multi-threshold is kind of something I, I'm not sure if, if folks are using it um, or if it was something I made up. Um, it's hard to know, but I do think that there are a lot of um, spaces and settings that use this language of low barrier, meaning, you know, come in as you are. If um, you don't have identification, that's okay. The registration process is easy. Um, uh, the, the, you know, maybe there are, um, you know, there's basic needs available, there's showers available, there's um, meals available, all of those things um, to really um, meet people, and in, in my case specifically, young people meet them where they're at. And what um, I learned um, at the Broadway Youth Center was really pushing myself to think of beyond low barrier and how important it is from a positive youth development framework to have a range of options and um, engagement strategies for young people as they evolve and change and grow. And so um, it's really important to not be afraid of higher threshold things. Don't be afraid of structure. Um, there are um, uh, young people who, you know, I'm one of those people who like I'm alive today because of organized sports, um, but maybe in other settings, it's, you know, programming that requires 
um, multi-week participation or trainings that eventually lead to some type of um, graduation ceremony. And that those are all things that um, uh, develop a relationship between a program and a participant. And, um, and I think it welcomes this idea that young people are going to continue to change and evolve and our space is going to change and, and evolve um, along with you. So um, I will, um, let's go to the next slide. Um, this uh, um, slide really reinforces that um, you can tell a lot about an organization or program by the number of young people that have been banned by the program um, and the organization's police or security presence. And so for our work at the Broadway Youth Center at that time, it was really important to really look at what was happening, um, what was keeping folks from even getting to the to the door in the first place and um, really doing some reckoning with um, uh, how the youth control complex was intersecting with um, the work that we were trying to accomplish at the time. So we can go to the next slide. So I talked a little bit about conflict being a resource. I truly believe that. I believe that relationships are everything and um, and that it's so important to have um, spaces that are um, really accessible for folks to share their feedback. And so it could be a complaint process. Um, at one point in, um, in our work at the, at the Broadway Youth Center, we had weekly community meetings. Um, it was the same agenda um, every week and we would rotate facilitation and young people would facilitate the meetings as well. And there was always a spot for folks to share feedback about what was going well and what we could do differently. Um, a little bit of the, the glows and grows kind of stuff. We worked really hard on um, thinking about how to be a place that could absorb crisis and um, and not be reacting constantly to crisis, which um, is also a huge challenge, especially as it relates to a lot of organizations' capacity. Um, we tried to stretch our imagination. We tried to think of um, really creative opportunities for um, um, hospitality and how that could show up in um, all kinds of different ways. And, um, and I think one of the things that's kept me in the social service sector for as long as I have been is that I truly believe that the work I'm doing, albeit imperfectly um, in systems that are um, really failing so many folks, it's like, I'm on the inside, how can I get as many people to the finish line as possible? And, um, and folks in this moment need basic needs and access to health and, and wellness resources. And, um, and how can I, you know, pull as many folks um, forward um, with the time that I have. And, um, and that finally, one size fits all does not equal um, Consistency. Consistency is something else. It's about um, structure that can um, bend and ebb and iterate and um, and have boundaries and um, evolve as the space evolves as young people evolve. And so um, you'll get that I think a lot if you've been one of those folks that's like, why are we banning so many people from our programs? Can we do something differently? And it's like, oh well, you know, it's um, we need consistency is, is, you know, is an important value. And I agree, and I interpret it differently from this um, one size fits all zero tolerance um, paradigm. All right, next slide. Um, I'm obsessed with Venn diagrams and the intersection. And so for me, what's really exciting about this work is that it's um, about the things that we can do to prevent um, um, violence, the things that we can do to intervene in the moment, and the things that we can do um, after it's all said and done, what could we have done differently to have, you know, prevented this from happening in the first place. And, um, and these are all mutually reinforcing. And what I love about this is that there's a role for everyone. I um, have gone through so many peaks of burnout, intense compassion fatigue, um, challenge, I mean, just leadership transitions that are extremely challenging. And I can always find myself 
um, here. I might have more energy in certain capacities to do the prevention work. Um, in other times, I've had a lot of energy to do the intervention work. And so, um, so just wanted to offer that. And then the next slide is, of, or of course, another um, Venn diagram. And it's really, I think, a reminder um, uh, of, of all of these kind of intersections around. Um, and something that really guided our intervention strategies was that um, we're not one thing, that we're all of these things. We've created harm. We've been um, bystanders, um, witnesses. Um, we've been healers, we've been circle keepers, we've also been survivors. And so um, really acknowledging that intersection um, is um, a huge part of this and, um, and really guided our, our practice around, you know, um, that this kind of idea of a no perpetrators policy is an ineffective strategy because um, we recognized more than the duality. It's like all, all of these things. Um, uh, and that you know, when and if young people needed safety plans, um, that those were led by young people and their expertise and allowed um, those folks to define their own experience, knowing that maybe the way it's defined is also going to change over time. And then we also did a lot of work around activating the bystander and what that can look like in a drop-in space, for example, um, so that there is a culture that um, lifts up the values of the space in some um, ways that act as a really important um, prevention and intervention strategy. All right, next slide. Um, and then this is the, the final um, Venn diagram, but I really just think that um, these are all really important components of, um, of what we designed. And so um, uh, I think that, um, uh, the one thing that, you know, is connected to all of this is relationship building. And so I'll just, you know, keep saying that again and again, that I think one of the most important strategies, if you were to kind of move away from this um, webinar with anything, it's that um, so much of the work um, is reliant on one-on-one -on -one space and um, small group space for really um, intentional long-term um, relationship when it's possible. All right, next slide. So um, um, I, in terms of just moving us um, towards more of the specifics related to the Broadway Youth Center, I wanted to just share um, a little bit about the history and the story. The organization was formed collaboratively by four different organizations in 2004. And, um, and so it presented this really interesting um, yeah, it was just an interesting time because all four of those organizations had different approaches to youth work. Some were more clinically focused. Some um, uh, some of the approaches were like radical hospitality meets faith-based meets harm reduction stuff. Um, and so it created a really um, interesting opportunity to, to really, I think, do some sparring about, well, what do we wanna create here and, and what will work here? Um, we, um, um, you know, uh, were faced with a lot of initial issues. So um, those included um, increasing amounts of physical um, violence. There were um, almost daily incidents where someone's um, internalized oppression would bounce off of someone else's internalized oppression and, um, and lead to, um, um, verbal violence, sometimes physical violence. And so an example of that is, um, you know, I think um, uh, a trans young person um, saying something really hurtful um, to another trans person and, um, and really thinking about what are the conversations that we need to have here? Because um, if we push folks out every time they, you know, say something, hurtful or unkind or even violent to another young person, we lose all these opportunities to, I think, think about how those relationships may, and I mean, most likely would continue outside of the space. And so how do we hold folks as close to us and for as long as possible to have some of these bigger conversations? 
We also had a huge um, volume of youth participation. And so um, there were times where the space was just super crowded, super hot, and folks didn't have a place to sit down. There wasn't enough basic needs. There wasn't enough food. And so um, it felt like scarcity in every direction. And um, we can go to the next slide. An example of this was really, I think, um, looking at the, the chain reaction, um, we, um, we can go to the next slide, um, where I think you can see here um, the role that scarcity plays. Um, and, um, you know, so, you know, talking about some of the diminishing basic needs, um, and that would amp up um, interactions, sometimes amp up the space that can then lead to burnout, staff turnover, um, and then without those critical relationships that um, youth workers have with young people that can lead to um, uh, instability, um, which can then lead to um, physical violence, um, verbal violence in spaces, which then um, lends itself to um, um, security interventions, law enforcement. Um, there were times where um, you know, uh, um, young people, like, and a great example of this was the conversations we had to have as a community when young people felt unsafe and felt like um, calling 911 from our center was the only resort. And then law enforcement would be coming to our space. Um, and, you know, there would be 60 young people, you know, um, accessing services. And so, um, and then you, and then, you know, the result of that is young people not feeling safe in your space, not wanting to return, um, being unsure of what the expectations are, how we're going to um, keep each other safe or as safe as possible, and the, and the cycle would continue. So the next um, slide is really, um, I think a lot of what I, I think about is the container that we want to build for the work that we're doing. And at that time, everything was just like popping out of the container. Um, and we were trying to do too much with too little. And, um, and, um, and so we um, came up with um, some, some new strategies to move away from the container of, of chaos. And so that's really how chat was born. We can go to the next slide. Um, a lot of the thinking was like, how do we create opportunities for healing, for long-termness, for integration, embodiment, um, and how does that, when we do that, how does that reduce harm and violence and law enforcement? And, um, and there were so many staff who were really excited about that integration and embodiment work and so how to activate um, those folks to be a part of that. So that's how CHAT was born. CHAT is a part of the case study and it um, stands for Community Healing Accountability and Transformation. And we can go to the next slide. Um, and really, um, I think what I want, um, I guess to say is a couple of things. This is this is the container that we eventually got to. It's like holding um, all, all the messy stuff as well as possible. Um, and um, we really valued participation and wanted um, to bring young people and youth workers together to um, partner on what accountability could look like. Um, we tried to always recognize the impacts of oppression and internalized oppression and a big part of our success and sometimes our challenges was connected to internal communication. So how are we coordinating and orchestrating all of these different accountability plans and strategies that are super individualized. And it's a lot of work. And when you're really stressed out and exhausted physically, emotionally, the thing that we did was we had you know, very practically a standing meeting every week, um, the same group of folks, we would rotate folks in and out based on, you know, if they needed to take a break from this accountability work. We only had the capacity to have um, staff participation only. We really aspired to have young people participate in that accountability work at some point, um, but we're not able to realize that. And the format of that meeting was really, um, if, you, if you drill it down, it was about coming together, taking a breath, gathering information, sharing what we know, um, and, um, and then it was really just about 
creativity and idea generation. Okay, so this young person um, hurt this other young person. Who knows this person the best? Um, how can we set up a time to get more information about what med um, what happened, why it happened, some of the context? Um, um, is there a way to bring these two young folks together to have a conversation? What could that look like? Um, do we think we're we're ready for that? Is the space ready for that? So just like uh, there's um, I some some good kind of questions of like how to guide that conversation, and then what is the plan for ongoing support? And so. Um, Oh, and also I will try to keep looking at the Q&A piece, um, but um, feel free to stop me if I'm um, moving before answering questions. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, so super, super dynamic process. And, um, and so we can go to the next slide. I wanna just say that the um, volume of engagement was massive. And so I think, what I tried to tell folks is that this kind of work can happen in a lot of different settings and it can happen in settings where there's a huge volume of, for example, young people coming through. I think um, at that time, our drop-in had about 650 ongoing young people um, participating in programs, um, you know, 3,000 contacts throughout the year. So those young people returning again and again, and um, and across all of our services, about 20,000 contacts in one year. And during the time that I was there, you know, the strategies that we put in place, you know, um, did. I mean, it was it was wild. I mean, the there were zero arrests um, on site during a time where we had, you know, a. Um, uh, surveillance, CPD had surveillance 24-7 um, uh, and, you know, locked in on our front door. There were always cop cars present during our kind of like high volume hours. Um, and uh, there was just significant risk um, outside of the building um, at, at, I mean, you know, um, at all hours of operation in some ways. And so um, this felt like a really, um, big achievement and something really worth um, fighting for. And, um, and so some of the learnings that I wanted to share with you, we can go to the next slide, are, um, you know, uh, I guess a few things that I want to pull out. Um, and it's um, one of the things that we did was we um, had this thing called campaign capacity. And, um, and it was really just getting real with what we had and what we didn't have. And so I really resist, um, you know, I consult with organizations um, and, and, and have um, since I left the Broadway Youth Center. And there's just so much energy around like we need a 24 seven site. We need a 12 hour a day drop in that's operating seven days a week. And I think um, what I've learned during this time is just getting super real about the capacity and funding and resources that would be necessary to pull that off. For us, um, what we did was we got super real about our ability to do relationship building, um, the supplies and resources that we had, the structures that we had, and you know, of course, the number of staff and partnerships that we had. And so it was really important to us to have um, as much as possible, the same group of um, youth workers, um, so that if a young person, you know, um, was coming into the space for maybe the first time in a couple of weeks, that there would always be one or two people that they would know. Um, those things were important to us. And so that meant, you know, um, really, I think, um, quality over quantity. And, um, and, uh, and really, I think resisting this um, scarcity mindset and trying to figure out ways to make what we had feel or be experienced as, um, as most abundantly as possible. We did lots of community meetings, we got lots of feedback. And um, I think that um, uh, um, the popular education piece, I think, you know, can't be underestimated. When we did have resources, we invested those in paid youth leadership opportunities. And then the goal was always that those young people would then drive our programming, um, keep it interesting um, and keep it relevant. And, um, and so a lot, a lot of work goes into doing that. And so some of the key learnings um, on the next slide 
um, I found this image of just like organized chaos that feels like youth work to me. Um, making sure that you have a lot of availability for one-on-one -on -one space is critical. And that um, a real like love of messy, um, that's a huge learning. And um, I think for me, one of the big signs of burnout is when um, I start to see less gray. And so um, making sure that the space can and does hold all of the things um, and allows young people to show up in different ways at different times. And that um, when you're really exhausted, like I was, um, uh, that you build structures that you can repeat on autopilot and you have them in place, you have the blocked out time and you, if you don't need the time, you don't need to use it, but um, you always have it scheduled. And then I think finally finding the small wins and celebrating them. Um, Mariam um, does a good job, I think, of reminding reminding us to um, celebrate when we, when we have wins and, um, it's really, it can be really easy to, to miss, to miss the wins. And um, finally, this is the last slide before we take a break. And I want to make sure, well, let me like just interrupt me, I guess, if there are questions specifically about the Broadway Youth Center, but um, these are, you know, the challenges, of course, are numerous. And doing good youth work and good youth leadership development work is long-term, it's labor intensive, and it requires a lot of resources. I think that um, it's okay if you don't have the resources to do that work, and then it means you scale um, what you're offering or providing in some different ways. Um, and that um, maybe you decide instead to focus on um, investing in, you know, consistency among staff and volunteers and focusing on um, those trainings and learning spaces to um, really practice what kind of spaces you want to create. And so we called them at the time safety labs. I know we can call them, you yeah, know, there's lots of words for it, but really taking folks through step by step, um, you know, the, um, the, the chain of, of reaction. Um, I think that there's a lot to say about um, substance use and its impact on the space. Um, one of the things that was really important to us was welcoming folks who were high, low, under the influence into our space at any time. And the agreement is that you come as you are and there are um, agreements and expectations that we're going to hold you accountable to. So it means, um, you know, not being belligerent, not being um, verbally abusive, like all of those things. And so it was focused on the behavior, not what someone was coming in with. And so um, that was an, a really important value of ours. And there can and should be limitations to that too. So it's okay to say not today. And there were a lot of times where we would ask, ask folks to return the following day when it was a better time. And um, having those conversations in advance with young people to um, make sure that, you know, that I think if, um, yeah, I mean, it's all about the relationship. So you can start to have, if you have it, you can start to talk about some of those substance use patterns and behaviors, and then come up with a plan in the event that someone comes in and is not ready for a space that has, you know, 30 people in it, um, or um, has a bunch of programming happening. And so really, you know, um, having those real talks so that um, folks can even, you know, expect that they're gonna be asked to leave and return at another time, I think, you know, can, can happen. It, it certainly did in my experience. Um, and then I think the other piece of this is relationship building between the staff and knowing folks intimately around like what's the hardest for them, what boundaries are the hardest for them to um, to hold. And so um, an example of this is um, around sexual harassment and the role that other colleagues or teammates can, um, how they can show up um, to support you if you're experiencing that directly by a participant or a community member and um, having those conversations in a planful way, I think um, really, 
you know, gives people time and space to, to share in advance maybe what they would need to feel supported in a difficult moment. Maram, did you want to jump in? I saw your... Yeah, I was just going to say there are a couple of questions that might be relevant. So I want to share them with you for now, and then we can take a break. Great. Makes sense. So um, one question was just, what does embodiment work mean? I think you mentioned that before. Oh, wow. It can mean so many different things. And I, you know, I know um, there's um, a lot of expertise in this room too. So if you want to, you know, share your thinking on that, I welcome folks to, to um, post that in the chat. I think um, um, for us, it was a lot of little things. It was um, creating opportunities for um, dance and singing in our space. We would always have these like really wild talent shows. Um, uh, we had all kinds of random um, and ridiculous um, fashion shows. And so like the embodiment for me was um, creating space and time for folks to, you know, um, make something beautiful out of um, different pieces of fabric and beads. And um, I think um, embodiment is also breathing and meditation and um, uh, we, we did some acupressure, um, um, work with Young Women's Empowerment Project. Um, so it could be, you know, um, in maybe more of that traditional way. Um, yeah, generative somatics, great place to learn about this. Totally agree. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be different for everyone. Um, and, and, um, we also, as a part of our our service delivery model of care, we had um, therapists who were also on site who um, did some of that work with young people individually as well. Great. Um, the last question before we take a break would be, uh, can you talk about knowing the limitations of harm reduction and not wanting to be an enabler and finding that mm. balance? Yes. Um, it's so hard. And I think I've learned um, so many hard lessons about um, boundaries and limits. And, um, and it's always going to be, I think, I think the biggest part for me was getting support. And so bringing it to a group like chat um, was really important because then it's not just about you holding the line or holding the boundary. It's about a group of folks, a team who are saying there's a bigger picture here. And the bigger picture is the impact on the space, the impact on the community safety, the impact. Um, you know, I think maybe for those of you who've been, um, who are in the room, who've done youth work, I can't tell you the number of times where something wild is going down, like something ridiculously violent and, and young people just continuing to eat their meal at a table right next to it as if nothing's happening. Like the desensitization is so intense and so real. And so for me, it was like trying to stay awake around that, that, um, we, um, we can, um, uh, really push, push back against that. And, um, and and work to resensitize ourselves to um, all that stuff um, and have expectations in our spaces that are going to allow us to grow and be our authentic selves and um, be able to have hard conversations and be able to work on stuff and work on ourselves. And so um, having the team is really important. Um, and um, and having that kind of team consultation. And I think that's what's so hard about this too, is that if you're working with a group of people who maybe aren't politically aligned or aren't aligned from a values perspective, it can make this work, of course, really challenging. And so um, finding those folks is really important. And even if it's an ad hoc group that just meets informally, um, I think um, it's, it's really important. And I think that, um, it's okay to take a breath and to take a break. And so I can think of so many examples where, you know, we had to have some really hard conversations with some of our participants about like this, this can't go on like this right now. We've had these conversations, we've had these processes. And so um, we need a longer break. And, um, and so that would happen at times. And that allowed us to also, I think, 
um, utilize our capacity in some important ways, but super, wanna, super hard. Yeah. I just want to add a couple of things to this in respect to that question, you know, with respect to that question, you know, I used to talk to my staff all the time about the fact that I actually think it's a fallacy to talk about balance. What, what is going to happen is we're working with young people and we have to be what Lara brought up before individualized in our responses to those particular young people. So on one day, I may be much um, less hard on a particular young person because the context of their lives in that moment dictates that I'm that way. On the other hand, if it looks like I can push in a different kind of way, I might be harder on them because they have other things in their lives that give them a soft place to land in that particular moment. So a lot of this is like actually probably being out of balance quite a bit which is to be focused on the context within which you're working. And this is why to me, if you're doing youth work, individualized experiences really matter. It matters that you know the young person that you're working with, that you get to know them because that lets you kind of figure stuff out in a way that just trying to do an assembly line way of interaction doesn't. And that to me is part of what causes conflict is the not knowing of the person reacting in a certain kind of way that just, you know, you don't know what their needs are, you don't know what their position is, you don't have a set, and so you act out of pocket because you don't know who the person is. This the conflict resolution stuff is not actually hard. It's very, very focused on, are, do the people that we're working with, do they have their needs met? If they don't have their needs met, it's probably more likely that we're gonna be in conflict with each other. And if we can't address that, then we're going to continue to be in conflict with each other. So I think part of the, you know, I'm a Libra. So I do know the concept of, of a balance is embedded within my sign. But I actually really reject it on multiple levels because I think we have to often be out of balance. You got to do more when people need more. You got to be more present if people need you to be more present in that time. You can pull back when it feels like you might be able to get at a different level. And I think this is very, very important. And that doesn't satisfy people because they want a cookie cutter answer. They want a one way. And the thing that I've learned over the years from transformative justice practice and praxis is there is no one way. It is messy as hell. People are messy. People change their mind constantly. I changed my mind constantly. Yesterday, I was feeling a certain kind of way. And today I woke up on a bad side and now I'm feeling a different kind of way. And if you ask me the same thing that's happened, <laughs> you maybe got a different response from me yesterday than you did today. You may find that to be something inconstant about me, but I'm just telling you that I'm just living in the world and responding to the inputs and the outputs of that world on a given day. And if we can't hold all those things, then it's very hard for us to be able to have impacts of the kind we want in the world. So I just wanted to add that to the mix because I do think this is really critically important. And especially when we're working with young people, especially when we're working with children who don't know themselves even close to yet are developing, are going to be mercurial as fuck because nothing is under their control even their emotions, right? And this doesn't mean that I think that, you know, ch young people and children are quote, less developed. I do think they have had less time on the earth and therefore less experiences and therefore less options to be able to manage things because they haven't had the experience before of that thing. It's much easier when you've experienced something to be able to look back and be like, okay, that happened at that point of time. I, I had a point of reference. This is how I handled it last time. It wasn't great, new things, new learning. Much harder to do that when you just arrived and you've been here for 10 years, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I just think that these are the things that I really have thought about and learned over the years that make all the difference in how we intervene and also how we do violence interruption and violence prevention and harm reduction. Hello, hello. We are back everybody. Thank you so much. Um, I want to, I want to um, take us through uh, to the last few minutes of our time together. 
Um, so Eva, if you can advance the slide for me, please. Uh, one more, thank you. So what's, at, is it, no, okay, go back, sorry. What's actually in this toolkit, um, you can look at obviously the, um, the table of contents yourself, but I'm, so I'm not gonna take us through that. What I think um, when I just use this time for is to highlight some things in the toolkit that you might want to use in your own context and settings that I think are useful. And I'm a, I'm a checklist girl, so I love, I love myself a checklist. So you, there are lots of checklists in here. <laughs> Um, but I think they're useful because they kind of let us know where to go and what to do um, and where to start when we're having a hard time starting. Um, I also noticed that somebody had a question in the chat that I want to bring in, which was, uh, what recommendations would you have for people working in entry level positions with carceral leaning nonprofits who may struggle to figure out how to bring these strategies um, in given their there's these strategies and given their lack of power within the organizations. I think this is so critically important and real. Um, and I want to, to talk about some strategies for that, um, that I think might be useful. Uh, also, this is not in the toolkit, but I, I like to bring this up to people because I think sometimes we get stuck when we're in hostile environments or even environments that are not particularly hostile, but are not inspiring. Uh, we can get stuck to think that all we have around us is what we have at work, who we have at work, who our coworkers are in the moment. And I just want to remind all of us, because I think this is critically important. How many of you have kitchen table cabinets? <laughs> kitchen table cabinets. These are people that are in your life who are complementary in the work that they're doing. They may not be in the exact same field, but they are kind of in your in your sphere, who you admire in some way, or you learn from in other ways, or you've met at some conference gathering, or you've whatever. Bring those people in close. Make those folks part of your community of people that you can think alongside, who you could cry on the shoulder of should you need to, who will be able to in some way uh, relate to what you're going through and what you're doing and can offer some keen and helpful advice at those particular times. Um, you know, Lara was part of my kitchen table cabinet, even though I don't call it that, but I relied on Lara quite a bit with thoughts and, and this is what's going on or listening or attending events that Lara organized or using those as opportunities for connection to help me where I was. You know, um, other friends of mine, you know, Tanuja and Stacey and a community of other people who were not in the exact same workplace that I was in, but that I absolutely relied on and learned from and stayed inspired because of. So even if you don't have it within your toxic nonprofit, you can create it outside of that. You know, you could have a Sunday morning check-in. Now we have Zoom. No excuse for us not to take an hour on a Sunday afternoon at three o'clock and get our coffee together or our tea together, bring our kitchen table cabinet together for an hour once a month and just be like, where are you, how y'all doing? <laughs> how y'all, you know, how y'all are holding up in your places of employment right now? Because I know I'm struggling, you know? There's no reason not to do that. I just want to point that out that we have more at our disposal in terms of resources and relationships than we often think about and that we feel like drained and taxed in the places we are. And what that does in the, the kind of cycle that Lara pointed out about how young people react to a deficiency in resources, we react that way too as workers. Okay, we, we also become scarcity focused and uh, therefore in conflict with everybody in our surroundings. <laughs> and we just have to remember to like, you know, yeah, put on your own oxygen mask first, get that stuff and be able to fight for another day. So I'm just gonna say for the entry level people, find some other entry level folks elsewhere who you can band together with and get ideas from, but also get support from, for what you're going through on the inside. Now, more specifically, if you go into the toolkit, we offer on pages, um, let me see if I can just find that here. Um, we, we offer on pages uh, 49 through 
50 through 51, a specific set of like a case, if you're gonna try to make it to your administration, a case for resource reallocation, specifically as in this case, as it relates to costs and on-site security. So sometimes the people at the top will love to hear about ways that they could save money while also continuing to do the work that needs to get done or reallocate money within the institution. If you come to them with a case, you know, if you come to them with a well-argued set of facts, <laughs> this is what it looks like right now. This is what we could do instead. Might you give us at least six months to try it out, a year to try it out, right? To have conversations, to bring your facts and your experience to the table and make the offering. A lot of times, listen, I have to say this too. I've been a supervisor of people now for many years. And sometimes people who work for you project onto you things that are really not there in the sense that their own feelings of whatever are going on and those get projected onto you. You've done really nothing to prove to anybody that you wouldn't listen, but all of a sudden you're the horrible person who's not listening because they've been in other toxic situations and workspaces where no one listened to them. But meanwhile, you could have come to me at the very beginning and we could have discussed these kinds of things and you could have found that I was much more receptive to your ideas, especially if they're well thought out. And it looks like you've actually taken the time to bring some, you know, bring some facts and some information and some ideas. And it's not just a complaint for no reason. Though I also am pro complaints, but I do think that you get further if you actually come with a case that looks like you've spent some time thinking about it and you can make an offering to somebody, people will react to you as a human being and come with you. And then what more likely to be honest to say like, we can't actually do this right now. And here, here's my reasons for why we can't do this right now. You don't know this because we don't talk about this in organizations. We literally lost two of our biggest funders last week. Now they're into something else. They're not funding us anymore. I have zero dollars and I'm literally up all night trying to figure out how I'm going to raise that money to make sure that the organization doesn't have to lay off five people who I know personally can't afford to lose their jobs right now, right? So as the quote overarching boss who's in charge of keeping the organization afloat financially, you know, I may be stressed to the gills, but like I'm not necessarily going to be talking about all of that with the staff in the moment that's happening because we're trying to figure out what to do to be able to lessen their stress and strain. Right. And so there's lots of stuff that's going on, I think, that we have to be able to look at. The next thing I want to point out is on pages um, 56, you can look on in the toolkit. This is where some checklist stuff is really helpful. Applying procedures and best practices. We offer a list that is not in any way exhaustive of kind of must have policies and procedures for programs to actually prioritize. And I say this all the time, and it's very important. When you're in an organization, you must and should be collectively reviewing policies with your staff and other people in those spaces. What are the policies you have on sexual harassment? What about confidentiality? What about grievances? What about what is going to happen in emergencies and crises? Do you know what the policies of your organizations are right now? I'm asking this to every one of you. Have you, no one goes through that stupid employee handbook, by the way, okay? That has all the information, except at a time of conflict and when shit's hitting the fan. Now everybody's running to the written up policies. Everybody join over there to see if they can lawyer themselves up to figure out how to prove to somebody that they violated some rule. No, y'all. We got to get that early on and we got to keep reviewing, keep reviewing and keep changing. Sometimes the thing you came up with, now everybody's mad because they don't want, they think it's not the thing that's needed anymore or new, a bunch of new people showed up. We're dealing with that right now in a formation I'm part of, right? Like a bunch of new people show up, they have different ideas, different views, different culture. And now, you know, the thing that was on the books before doesn't fit for the current times. That's not something to be mad about. That's something to, an opportunity for change and shift. 
I promise you those new people who put that shit on the books for this time are gonna get yelled at in two years by somebody else who says they didn't take into account X, Y, Z. Instead of feeling defensive about that, I welcome that, especially if the people complaining or making the grievances are going to do the work. What I am not down for is drive by shit, okay? The complaint with no, no interest, no willingness to get into the trenches to actually make the thing work. That's also part of culture of institutions and organizations. The people who get that learned helplessness and the people who get that sense of like, it's somebody else's job to create the entire culture of this place. No, no, it is all our work. It's a shared labor. You have a role, your quote boss who you're forcing to do all this work cannot do it by themselves. And therefore, if you're waiting for that to happen, you're not gonna get far, okay? The, the culture is going to remain toxic and maybe get more toxic because now people, more people are mad. <laughs> so you can go to this in particular and look at asking yourself questions. What is the privacy and confidentiality procedure here? What are the grievance policies, right? How are we going to deal with issues of hospitalization for participants in crisis if you're in a youth center? What are our emergency procedures? When a young person calls 911 themselves, how are we as a staff going to respond, right? What are our legal things that we need to know about here? It, what are the facts on that level? What are we willing, what rules are we willing to break? That's my question all the time to people. <laughs> it's like, we have some stuff on the books, but what are we willing to break? What are we going to, you know, we're not going to announce that. We're not going to maybe write that down, but as a staff, what have we decided we're not going to do now culturally in our space, even if it's on the books as a thing that we have to do? You have to have those conversations. We have to be doing that. And guess what? People say they don't have time. You always have time. You can incorporate within every single staff meeting a half an hour of time just on that. And it can become part of the praxis and the practice of your space. People say they don't have time for, for political education. Ridiculous tack on an extra hour and you don't have to make it even mandatory. You can say, we're going to have an extra hour of political education time, two to three. Anybody who wants to show up for it is welcome, but it becomes part of the practice. And every time people know two to three, once a month, political ed is available. You're going to see people who are going to drop in. There are going to be people who are going to drop, who aren't ever going to drop in. That's fine. They're allowed to do that, but at least you will have met some people's desires and needs and you'll have provided some space for people to learn together and grow together and keep that going and make that standardized so everybody knows when it's happening and they can just keep showing up and again if a lot of people don't show up it doesn't matter the people who are supposed to be in the room are the people who are supposed to be in the room for the moment that you're in right so these are just some things i wanted to point out specifically that are in the toolkit that i think are very important and that you should take a look at closely and think about the security considerations. Think about your ongoing needs of staff training and how you're gonna get that together. Think about whether your environment is hospitable or not to people who are showing up in there. When people show up, does anybody say hello to them? <laughs> this seems like a small thing, but it is such a huge thing in nonprofits. Nobody to greet anybody. You show up, everybody looks at you, they're exhausted, tired, stressed out. We gotta have that. Gotta have that, y'all. Gotta have some radical hospitality going on, right? That's part of setting the culture of a space. And you know, you all know this experience. You've walked into some religious institution before. Yeah? And you've walked into some spaces and listen, on the left, we are terrible at this, y'all. You leave people at the door, but nobody looks at you. You walk in, it's like, how are people supposed to feel like they want to show up there? Nobody walks up as a greeter and says, hey, welcome. What do you need? You know, we're here. My name is Miriam. I'd love to let you know what we have available here. And if you need anything, bathrooms are over here. This is like, why, are, why is nobody doing that? Do you know any church that doesn't have that? You don't know, you don't, you've never been to a church service where the pastor doesn't say at the beginning, we got some new guests here, people who showed up new, new people stand up, 
Now you, you may decide to sit your ass down because you don't want to be standing up in front of a thousand people, but they will call out the new folks and they will say, welcome. Tell us your, you know, yell out your name, Mary. Oh, Mary, Mary, welcome. We're so happy to have you. And then when it's over, the people are planted in the audience so that they come up to you at the end before it's all over. And they've said, hi, how are you? I noticed you were new. My name is Beth and I'm the greeter for this morning. And I just want to welcome you again and please ask me any questions that you may have. Anyway, I just think these things are important and we do not raise them enough and people forget it costs us nothing to do this, y'all. It costs zero dollars. You don't need resources for this. You just need people and imagination and a, a decency. <laughs> so I want to end here uh, to get back to Lara because Lara has some stuff to add and then would love for you to, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A now and we're going to answer them. So Lara, you're on. Thank you. I love all of that. I mean, in terms of just um, going to the next slide, I think this aligns with, um, you know, a lot of what Miriam's already shared around just, you know, understanding the organizational setting that you're working in and who are the decision makers, what resonates with them, is it funding, is it um, liability and um, compliance concerns, like what get get into those um, into those heads. Um, and then I'm a I, I think, you know, this has just been my strategy, but there's something about having a proposal written down. It could be even a one or two pager, um, but making it, you know, um, concrete, actionable, coming with solutions, all of that. I think um, sometimes I've, when I've gotten pushed back around some of my ideas, it's like, well, we don't have any data to support this. And so make the case. I think um, it's, uh, you know, one of my strategies has been testing something for two, three, four weeks, documenting your successes and learning. So, uh, you know, a little bit of plan, do, study, act, and um, and get that data for yourself and share that. Um, and then I also think that you're more likely to get a yes around some of these ideas if you pitch it as a pilot. It's a one month pilot. It's a six month pilot. Chunk it. Start small, and. Um, and don't ask for the entire kitchen sink um, at the beginning. Um, really build the case um, while your organizational culture hopefully is shifting and you're also engaging more colleagues, peers, leaders, et cetera, in um, your efforts. And then in terms of um, the next slide, really, um, I could like um, talk about this all day long, but I do think that there are things that get really twisted up that, um, um, are just wrong. And, um, and so a lot of the pushback that I've received over the years um, around some of the intervention work um, that I thought was really important was connected to um, issues around mandated reporting, privacy and confidentiality concerns. I remember getting pushback around even being able to have two young people participate in a conversation together about something that had happened in the space to both of them that they had both participated in as a confidentiality issue. And that is just a, that is just a, a wrong interpretation of what we mean by privacy and confidentiality. And so um, I think, you know, it's so true. It's like once something happens, everyone gets out the forms, gets out the policies and is, is looking at the fine print. And I think, you know, I, um, uh, yeah, just, you know, I, everything can change. Um, a policy, a poor policy can be written. And maybe one of the ways that you um, want to create changes by advocating for some changes to that policy. And I also want to just say too, that I think what's challenging about policies is that um, I think sometimes you'll have leaders and organizations with a very confined um, scope of like, okay, this is what a policy is and this is what a policy isn't. And typically policies are very much oriented towards kind of this one size fits all. It's around safety issues. If there's, um, you know, a, nat a natural disaster, there's a fire, th these are the steps and the protocols that we're gonna take. And so when I've worked with other organizations around this, we've created a complementary document. Um, it could be a different kind of handbook, but it, it's really focused on guidelines. What are we going for here? And um, 
uh, really outlining, for example, if you want to have something like chat in your space, putting that into this guidelines document of like, this is how we respond to um, issues, incidents, crises between young people and between young people and youth workers. And this is the type of conversation that we have. This is the structure for that. Um, I think um, leaders love to see um, something written. They want to see that it costs zero dollars. They want to see that um, there's structure to it. And, um, and, uh, and, you know, so there's that. And then I think um, the other piece is around organizational risk and liability. And I remember being so scared of those words and, um, and also seeing how organizations are so prone to outsourcing risk. And so an example of this is hiring a security firm to do your security work and not hiring them in-house because you don't want the responsibility of having them employed for you, by you, being accountable to your handbook, et cetera. And um, I think what we try to do in the toolkit is make the case for why this is actually inefficient it's cost ineffective and it actually increases liability because if something goes wrong, um, then, you know, uh, there are still, you know, issues around how you create um, accountability between the organization you're working for and that, um, that entity or that company. And so um, I just, I find, I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I find these types of responses to be um, usually baseless and made by folks who are ill-informed on these topics in, um, in a substantial way. And, um, and so um, I just encourage, I think, I guess, I encourage folks to just reach out, get support, ask questions, hear about what other organizations are doing or not doing, and really get that cabinet um, uh, kitchen table together to talk through it because it's like this thing to get us to um, not move forward. And it, you know, it's like, I nothing shuts down something interesting and innovative faster than the words liability and risk mitigation. And um, I'm here to tell yeah. you that there yeah. is a way forward and don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't get messed up by those words. I would also add, uh, and we'll take questions in a couple of minutes because we only have five minutes left after that. Um, but I just want to add a, a thing as well that it's been super helpful to me that somebody shared that I find so useful. Um, and it's this kind of evaluative criteria. Um, this is from Fernando Flores, this Conversations for Action. Uh, you know, <laughs> part of what all this is, is you're going to have to partner with other people to get shit done. And one of the things that's so hard is that point. You're gonna have partner with people to get shit done in your spaces. And some of those people are gonna be folks that will be on the same you know, wavelength as you and others will be people who aren't on the same wavelength with you. And I think it's really helpful to have these questions at the ready all the time as you are implementing new policies, new who will do what and by when. I cannot tell you how much conflict can be avoided if you actually have something written down about who will do what and by when. The by when is so critical because if there's no by when, people aren't going to be moved to get shit done because we're all going to have different ideas of time and what time means for us. Got to put it down on paper. How will we know when it is done? Like who is going to either communicate that the thing happened? How will we communicate that it happened? Right? Are we checking it off our list? How are we going to do that? Will there be a meeting in a month whereby we're going to go through all the things and be like, we did this, we did this, we did this. Or is some one person in charge of doing that? And how will they communicate to everybody else that it got done? Who is going to assess that it's done? Okay, this to me is really important because it's not just that you got the particular thing done, but it's like, do people think it's any good? Do people think it's actually useful? Is the thing that got done what we had all agreed to getting it done or did somebody cut corners for lots of really valid reasons and the thing that got done isn't quite right? 
Who's going to assess that within the organization or the group? Okay. What authority or competence do they have to assess that it's done? So listen, I may be close friends with Laura, okay, and I am, and Laura's good at a lot of shit, but Laura doesn't know everything. And if Laura's the one in charge, eight, for example, of telling everybody that the thing that's on embodiment is done, and Laura's not an expert in embodiment, and maybe doesn't even know how to be assessed that that is what, you know, who, we got to have the right authority and competence to assess that it's done so people feel good about that thing, right? Who's going to communicate that it's done after it's over? We Are we having some sort of report back? Is there a way that everybody knows that this shit got done? Are we having another training session to check in with each other in a couple of weeks to see? Like what, what's happening there? And then what authority or competence do they have to communicate that it is done? Again, the right people have to be able to be the ones to talk about stuff in organizations. You all know this is true. Somebody who's disrespected within the organization holding stuff together is not going to get the thing that you created a new grievance procedure. Here's my example, the perfect example, new grievance procedure. It was created by people who no one respects within the organization. Those people go out and say, now we have the new grievance procedure. Hi. How likely do you think the organizational rest of the folks are to take that thing seriously and try to implement it? Or have you actually under, under like immediately made it so that it's impossible for anybody to actually take that thing seriously because it was in the wrong hands? <laughs> and But I don't mean wrong hands because these are terrible people. I'm just saying you have to have assessed within your organization, who are the credible messengers? Who are the people, every, there is everybody, there's not, when I was teaching, there were the teachers who every single person in the building knew could do discipline, not in a horrible way. All of a sudden you, you all, if you've been in schools and if you've taught in schools or you've visited schools, you ask every teacher in the building, who are the teachers that the kids don't fuck with? There are always some. What exactly are those teachers doing so the kids aren't fucking with them? No one in the building asks. <laughs> Nobody goes and like figures out what the secret is, gets them in and lets them do the professional development. They bring some outside person who has no connection to the universe, to the institution to come and be an expert and speak to the people. Meanwhile, you could have gotten the teacher in the eighth grade classroom right there who knows what the hell is going on. The same kid goes into Mrs. Grant's classroom. All of a sudden, that kid is on perfect behavior. They come into Mr. Jackson's classroom and they acting up. Why the hell is that going on? So anyway, I just want to put that out there because this is important in this idea of this toolkit. Okay? We are not telling you that this is a checklist of step-by-step -step that just willy nilly you're going to do and it, no you're going to have to work <laughs> you have to pull some stuff together pull some people together assess the landscape within your organization know when to press know when to step back but i have faith in folks we do this all the time in different ways but we may not be systematic or strategic about it but we do it i'm just saying let's get systematic and strategic about it and we will do better so we don't have that much time. There aren't that many questions in the chat. So uh, Lara, maybe we can just take a couple of them here. The last one here. How do you know that it's not possible to stay in the organization and implement these changes from grassroots to nonprofit based on this toolkit and your experiences? How, so how do you know that it's not that it's not possible? When do you know that? That it's time to like cut bait? basically, I think is the question there. Ooh. <laughs> you go first. <laughs> I gotta think about that. <laughs> oh, I think you know, I think you know when I think you know when you're trying when you've tried things over and over again, and it's gotten no traction. I think you might know if not not just you've tried it, but you've seen other people try it. And it's also fallen uh you know on a situation where things haven't gotten resolved right it's not you know it's like i always think if it's just me then it may be just me but if other people have or different than me have had the same experience over and over again then it's a collective systemic problem you know it's not just a personal 
personality problem. So I would just see to the extent that you've tried, but really tried. I don't mean like in your head tried, right? Like, cause there's a difference there. There's the thing we, the, the, there are the things we try uh, that we actually go to the steps of like getting the data, making the meeting, going and sharing it, getting rebuffed, trying one more time. Like that's, you know, trying. And then there's the, I was mad. I said something and nothing changed. <laughs> and that's what I call trying in your head <laughs> because that's not trying. You haven't actually expended any effort to do anything transformative or change wise. And you've also not put yourself on the line in any way, you know? So I would say if you put yourself on the line several times and so have other people and it's not shifted anything, it's probably okay to think like the, this is a cultural systemic structural issue within the organization, not just about interpersonal stuff. So I think that's what I would say. And it's 831. Lara, do you wanna say one last thing before we end? I, I just, I mean, maybe the one thing I would want to close on is, um, I mean, in response to that previous question, it's like, you know, looking at the setting that you're working in, the organization, the project, and there's so much, there's been so much light shown on so many things in the last 18 months, especially as it relates to some of the COVID response, um, just pivots and creativity. And so if, if, if things haven't shifted as it relates to just like, we're going to, you know, start the F over on a few things um, like this has been the time to do that because um, it's just called for that. And if you you're a part of a space that's still holding on to like we're gonna go back to the way we did it before, or we're gonna you know we've got, we've got to hit those deliverables or those um, uh, those contract requirements that we had in place before COVID. Like I think that's that's all the information you need as it relates to like it's it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. So everybody, thank you so much. We had, uh, I wanna make sure that our wonderful interpreters, thank you, Glashonda. Um, and uh, I did not get the name of our other interpreter. Was it Miguel? Eva, who is our person? It's William. William, William thank you, William. Yeah. Thank you so much, William, for being here with us. Um, and also, uh, thank you so much, Debbie, uh, for filling in at the last minute for us in terms of captioning um, and to the whole team. Thank you all for being here and like sticking it out for two hours on a Thursday night. We really hope you got something out of our sharing of this. We hope you'll use the toolkit in your communities and we will see you hopefully at our next, I think we have two, after this we have two or three more sessions before we close out. So look up, uh, keep your eyes open for what we're gonna be doing next on that. So thank you all everybody.